is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Evolve, chapters five, six, no, I was going to say five, six, and seven, just five and six this time. In these chapters, we meet Aftermath, who is actually pretty scary. I think I find him scarier than Tretjak. Yeah, I'm interested. But not everything worked for me this section. We'll see. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Heather for commissioning this episode. Heather is here in the chat with me. Thank you, Heather, for always uh, coming and feeding me information when I inevitably forget people's names. Um, so I have to start this off by, uh, you know, touching on the fact that Heather's husband wrote this. And so I deeply understand that Heather will be protective of her husband's work and I am not going to be a douche. That said, there are some things here that I didn't love and I am going to be honest about that. So with respect, I will be touching on some of these things that kind of like bothered me overall. And then there were a few details that I found kind of odd and that didn't jibe with what I felt like the story had been telling me before. So we will get there. But first, I just want to talk about the concept of this guy aftermath. First of all, I don't think I've heard anybody use that word as like a, uh, you know, bad name, not bad name, even like superhero name. And I really like it. I think aftermath is a nice it's it's a kind of word that's like sort of neutral in a way that it can go in either direction. But if you choose to put it in a direction of somebody who's a bad guy, it feels much more chilling in a way because it's so neutral. Uh, this is something that I have noticed a lot with the writing of Will White, who does the Cradle series and the Elder Empire series, which I just started covering. And um, there's this whole segment of this um, agency that is assassins, but they are called gardeners. And their like calling card is just a like a literal business card with a little pair of pruning shears on it. And I don't know why, but like I found them so much scarier being called just gardeners with like shears. It just felt sort of uh, it made them feel a little bit more like, oh, this is just like a chore that we do. You know, it's a thing that it's no big deal. And so I really, really enjoy the feeling that I got initially when we were just told, oh, we found him. I was like, oh, what's this guy about? And then when we actually meet him, I didn't know what to expect. Obviously, we know that he has heat powers because somebody mentions that and then there's the heat signature that they're trying to track and they know that it's like so definite and, and particular a heat signature that they're confident they can identify him just using that, which it turns out is not true. But I didn't really have much of an idea of what you could do with a power like that. And it feels a little bit OP. Like this guy can really do so much damage. And that's just with his powers. And in this, we see what he can do when he also has like a, a coordinated team and time to prepare and some tools at his disposal. Uh, he really is so ready for them that it's worrying. And, uh, you know, we find out once we're in it from Jordan's perspective that <laughs> she wasn't psyched about the whole way that this mission was set up. It felt very sudden. It felt kind of slapped together and a little bit sloppy. She felt there was a real like emotional symmetry to the way she had been reacting on going in on Brian when she thought that he was in danger. She's like, somebody is too close to this. We shouldn't be doing it like this. This feels like reckless is the word. 
Um, as it turns out, there's good reason to feel that way. This is a setup. And we find out later that it it's not as if... Because I want to say, like, we find out later that Aftermath is working for Dr. Spears. It's not that simple. I He's certainly, like, working with Dr. Spears. I don't know which of them thinks they are in charge, but I'm sure that both of them do. And I would say that Aftermath... Uh, I could see him even though, like, you know... It depends on how much he knows about Dr. Spears. Is he aware that the dude is an alien or does he just think that he's like just an incredibly advanced, smart person? I'm, I'm interested in that actually, but we'll get there. Okay. So we start off with chapter five and it's, we're, we're in the midst of gunfire already. Shit has completely begun to pop off. And this is when we really begin to see how, unprepared our team is because they go into this thinking that they know how many people they're going to be dealing with. And then all of this like backup that they didn't know existed begins to sort of erupt like an anthill and they're just wildly outnumbered. There is some like, you know, some people that are waiting in the wings that they're able to call in, but they didn't intend for that to be how this worked. It was supposed to be backup, not part of the main mission. So already we're just operating at a huge disadvantage. Um, so at this point it's Viper and Chance teamed up together and they are going into this with like, they're, they're huddled up as gunfire is raining down on them. They're trying to get out of this like pinned position that they're in Chance is feeling a little bit salty about how they're only using stun guns, basically, which I can understand. And this is when she just is like, I'm just going to go out there and take care of this real quick. And we get a very fun action sequence of her doing her like flippy dips as uh, Portsmouth would have probably called it, the shit that he felt like she was negatively influencing Lily with. Um, yeah, here it is. Viper cartwheeled to the side to avoid a burst from the nearest man. Mid-flip, she drew the second justifier and fired a single burst of crippling energy. She spun on one hand, then came down in a wide-legged crouch as she ducked below another burst of bullets from another of the shooters. She rode the momentum and swept one leg around to throw her body into a tight spin that catapulted her back into the air. I gotta be honest, I can't picture that one. I was able to follow most of this, and it's very, like, gymnastic, you know, but that was the only one that I was like, I can't see that in my head, how that would happen. Um, with one pistol extended in front of her and the other to her side, she fired three times. Two black clad men behind her went down with shots to their center mass while the third caught the Merc directly below her in the face. So she takes care of that and then comes up on her, uh, her mic and it's just like the roof is clean. <laughs> and I love later when uh, chance comes down, he's like, uh, damn. So, then Chance gets his chance to shine. Get it? I love this so much. <laughs> I it, It's a real, like, it's an interesting moment because I think if it were reversed, Jordan would be mightily offended at the fact that Chance felt the need to jump in and handle shit for her. And didn't trust that she knew her own abilities well enough to use them and not get hurt. So she jumps in on Chance in this moment in a way that really like implies that she doesn't fully believe in his power. And even she even thinks that to herself, you know. And she says to him at one point, like, you better watch out because your luck is eventually going to run out. And he's like, oh, no, I've got plenty where that came from. And he's joking around. But she's genuinely a little shaken, I think, because she doesn't really understand how it works. And I mean, she's not alone. I don't either. I don't have to. I don't care. But I can understand when it's somebody that you care about and also somebody that's supposed to, like, have your back, that it would be very important to you, <laughs> you know, and... um, 
she's somebody that likes to have control over situations and being paired with somebody, their name is literally chance. I can see how this would feel really tenuous to her, you know? So he sets these discs and then they begin communicating with everybody about whether it's time to blow the doors. And McIntyre says, copy Viper, team three, status? Viper knew the man was eager to catch Aftermath. They had history, but she wasn't sure of the details. Aftermath had been part of the team at one point, but when went rogue without any warning. His files were classified, and mentioning his name was like issuing a curse amongst the team's operators. He was a traitor, and nobody on the team spoke of him with any fondness, though everyone recognized how dangerous he was. So, then we get this moment here. Um, that she, so they're talking about what a bad mood McIntyre is in. Then we have um, Douglas come in and says that they're in position, but he, it says that he doesn't have any warmth to his voice. Viper detected a subtle undercurrent of concern in his tone. That worried her. A man that was normally immune to most injuries shouldn't be worried about mercenaries with standard assault weapons and a few grenades. Viper frowned. Aftermath had the team spooked. And then it says, fear was a constant companion in the field, but you couldn't let it rule you. And later on, in when we are in Douglas's head, there is an almost identical line to that. Fear was a constant companion in the field. And I was, I stopped and was like, is that, am I imagining that? No, I went and checked and I highlighted them both. And it's almost the exact same wording down to, you know, um, and I really feel like if you're going to have, if, if you're accidentally, and I'm assuming that this isn't on purpose, if it's on purpose, then it doesn't quite work for me because it doesn't feel on purpose. It feels accidental. And if it is accidental, for me, that points to the fact that they are being written a little bit too similarly in their internal monologues. That feels like, you know, Douglas is, is a different type than Jordan in a lot of ways. They have a, 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 a similar commitment and seriousness about their work, but they are very different in their overall attitudes. And I feel like that indicates to me that it's not their, their like inner monologue. It's the author. And it took me out of it to read that later because it's not far off. I don't even think it's in the next chapter. I think it's later this chapter, but I might be wrong about that. Um, but yeah, here, so this one's fear was a constant companion in the field, but you couldn't let it rule you. And the one on his section is fear was a constant companion in the field, but hesitation had to be squashed. So really like the same exact sentiment. It's just the second half of it. That's like different. Um, and there's another spot here where it says overall the plan was straightforward perhaps too much so misdirection and cunning were viper's preferred methods of operation why fight 20 men when you could trick them into surrendering misdirection and cunning were viper's preferred methods of operation where when that's not true <laughs> like just straight up from what i have learned about her that is so not true she goes in guns blazing. Like we've literally seen her go in guns blazing without checking anything the way she should have in the first place. And granted that was a particularly emotionally ramped up situation, but nevertheless, if that's the way that she reacts when things are on high, I feel like that's a pretty good indicator of who she is. And this being like stated as a fact it, it was weird to me. I reread it a couple times because I was like thinking, is there, you know, I just thought I I was missing something, but it just feels like the author is tr telling us something that I think is the actual opposite of what we have learned about her personality. Misdirection and cunning is nowhere near the words I would use to describe the way that she decides to handle missions at all. She's out here 
doing flips and and shooting in midair and you know hopping from the hood of a uh SUV onto a motorcycle like there's nothing subtle or careful about any of that so i f- this was sort of weird because i think what he's attempting to do is indicate to us how uncomfortable she is with the way that the mission is set up but I just felt like this explanation just really didn't hit at all. It's fine for it to be like they didn't have enough intel. They were rushing. There were, you know, there's other ways to like give us reasoning why she wouldn't feel comfortable with this. And just this explanation to me, it was like, it felt like, you know, he didn't even know who she was for a second. Like he completely changed out the character just because for this line it was, you know, and I was just really like, uh, Creating such elaborate gambits took time, however, and even she had to agree they didn't have much time on uh, have much of that on hand. And yeah, I just wish like I don't think I remember any elaborate gambit that they had set up. Everything that we have seen from the last book has been them accidentally stumbling into stuff. So, or or things have been like a setup, but not in, for the intended outcome often you know um so yeah i just found that so jarring let's see heather says those weren't situations that she got to plan she was reacting to situations that were forced on her granted the moscow thing was her own emotional compromise that got her into that but she was reacting to the vodnik hurting them still that's a fair point we only got one example of her own planning at the very beginning when she was doing her sniper thing yeah and like by the time we get into all of this the sniper thing is It felt much like I don't I don't think that I understood how much of her input was put like part of that operation. The sniper thing felt like she had been given orders to lie in wait and handle it the way that she did. And so I don't I like all of it, I think, can be also put down to the fact that that's often her function is to follow orders and. I don't really feel like I have a good grasp on how she'd choose to handle something if she were given time to plan ahead because she's not really put in the position to do that often. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. It was just a, a weird moment that was very jarring to me. Um, let's see. Uh, Heather says the original plan at the start was that she was supposed to work with the SAS unit that extracted her going in solo was her plan. Okay. Um, oh my God, sorry. Rashawn is just like fucking blowing up my phone all of a sudden. Girl, I got to put on do not disturb. Um, so they are, uh, heading into this with everybody being hyper aware of how, (laughs) how dangerous this guy is. And he's dangerous in a way that feels very different to Trechak. People responded to Trechak in a sort of like, there was a bit of fascination there, I feel like. And this guy, it's more like, we've covered this terrain. We know who he is. We know what he can do. It's not about being like impressed exactly or curious about what his deal is. It's like, no, we've seen it and it's horrifying and we don't want to go through that again. And it's particularly understandable because of how much his ability is based on using fire. That's just like the most hideous way to die, in my opinion. Being lit on fire, yeah, count me out. No, thank you. So I think that a lot of people have that reaction to fire. If you've ever been burned, it's just ridiculous how much pain it is. It truly is out of proportion. Um, So... Uh, she knew he was powerful, that the team had lost one of their operators uh, to Aftermath's ability to control thermal energy. And that's really particularly, like, I like that specificity. It's not just fire, thermal energy, which is why he can just ignite things from afar. He's not shooting fireballs. It, it, like, if you're shooting fireballs, that's less threatening to me because that's something that you can, like, treat as a bullet. You can block it. You can put things in the way. 
But if you're using thermal energy, then then there's not necessarily anything that can get around that, you know, like, I don't know how you protect against that. The one advantage that he has later on in that fight is that Aftermath is feeling a little bit fucking playful and he decides to pick up a pipe instead of just burning the dude to death. And in the end, he does just choose to burn the dude to death. But initially he was like, well, but let's fuck around a little bit first. Um, And yeah, I just find that really scary. I hate it. So they uh, tell her Douglas and or no, not Douglas. I think this is. um, Oh, my God. Which one's Cronus? Remind me, Heather. I found this to be a little bit tough, too. I with everybody's like um, their code names. I just I have I had a hard time learning everybody's names to begin with and I felt like I was just starting to get it and now we're doing code names and I'm like at sea again. Tristan, thank you. Um this operation had been planned on the fly. There were no practice runs, no time to model a simulation of the building and have teams hit them over and over. A simple verbal walkthrough while the team was in transit was it. And see, for me that's enough. You know, we don't have to talk about, like, what her preferred methods of operation are. Just saying that is enough for me to be like, oh, yeah, okay, I understand why she's feeling uncomfortable with this. Um, so all teams execute on three. Cronus counted down from three. These things blow up the wall, just completely go through it. A simple sub-vocal command switched Viper's mask into ultrasonic mapping mode. Does that just mean, like, mind control? Did she, like, control her mask with her brain? Is that what this means? That is wild. Um, so this is when the whole thing with Chance comes in, and I love this so much. Uh, they swung their weapons in Chance's direction. And his response was to put his hands out to his side and smile. Viper growled and dropped into her accelerated state, but she was too late. The first weapon's muzzle flash hung in the air, slowly expanding as it fired the first bullet. The gleaming copper round shot out and missed Chance's head completely. The second and third bullets struck the armored shoulder plate of his costume and shot back toward the men on the catwalk. So she had tackled him by then, but it's too late. Like, this has already happened. (laughs) She watched as the twin bullets struck the second shooter in the face just before he pulled the trigger. The man was dead as soon as the first bullet struck him, but his lifeless hand squeezed the trigger of the assault rifle as it swept over the other mercs. The weapons remaining 27 rounds emptied, making a bloody ruin of the mercenaries. Lol. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that is hilarious. <laughs> oh, man. Can you imagine if you were that guy's, like, bud up on that catwalk and he gets shot from a bounced back bullet and then you watch the gun sweep towards you in his dead hand? You'd be so mad. You would be so mad like i oh that's the kind of shit where i'd be like where is the motherfucker i'm gonna haunt him like he's dead already i don't care i'll haunt him anyway i would be so angry there's nothing he could have done again it's total like odds it's there's it's not like the guy was so incompetent that this happened to him it has nothing to do with competence but nevertheless i would just be feel like that was super unfair no you know this is, this is the thing I often struggle with is like bad luck that feels targeted somehow. And you're just like, man, how am I not supposed to feel like this is personal? You know, the universe is like specifically fucking with me in a way that I just can't help but think you just don't like me. I really, that got to me. <laughs> um, And there's this moment here where she has, she's like on top of him because she tried to tackle him out of the way and chance is like i'm sorry i'm seeing someone and viper really does not get it like (laughs) she uh when she's in this zone her sense of humor is almost non-existent and she is not in the mood to like fucking jape not it 
just her and Chance feel like not a great matchup to me. They, she should be put with somebody else. But I can understand why they're put together. You aren't going to put her and Douglas together when they function similarly in a lot of ways, you know, as fighters. You want somebody who's going to accentuate the things that she can already do. So I understand the thought process behind it, but I just feel like they come at this from such different directions. It doesn't mesh well sometimes. Um, so, okay. We go to Cronus's POV. Um, and we he is with Harmony, who they've shortened his name to Harm. Uh, oh, thank you. And Heather is saying in the chat, um, Cronus is Tristan. Maxim is Portsmouth. I can't handle that his name is Maxim because I didn't know that Maxim was a type of machine gun. I just know the men's magazine with lots of scantily clad models that it's borderline porn. So when I found out that his name was Maxim, considering that he's such a misogynist, I just thought that was so appropriate in a way that's not flattering at all that I really, it was very funny. Um, Deckard is harm and Briar is auger. Auger. Huh. I forgot about that name, but he winds up dead. Or does he? Listen, I'm not going to lie. I am certain that these guys know whether or not the dude is dead. I don't think they're just going to have no body and they're going to say, oh, but he's definitely, he, he, he couldn't have survived. They're dealing with metahumans here. They have to know, like, you can't predict what somebody's going to be able to survive and not. You can guess based on what their abilities seem to be. But nevertheless, you know, how many other metahumans are there that aren't on your team? We think there's only the one and that everybody else is human, but we don't know that. So I think Briar probably is dead. But there was a part of me after what he did, like in the last book where he was so shady, that was like, did he fucking make some kind of deal and get out of this? I wouldn't be surprised. And it's also mentioned that like he's chosen a mask that covers his entire face, which then had me going like, well, was that Briar that was with them? What if the guy, you know, and again, I'm assuming they found his body and they pulled the mask off and it was Briar. But I'm so suspicious of this dude because he is such a shit. And I just, I don't know. I I would be surprised if after the amount of setup we've had of who he is, that he would be just killed in this scene and that would be it. But we'll see. Maybe it is. And I wouldn't be like necessarily mad about it because I really do not like him. But also, it would feel like a missed opportunity, I think. Um, but I guess we'll have to see. So this is when Harm says something about how they should have Lily with them. Um, she's the best one of us to deal with Aftermath's abilities. I am not entirely sure I understand how that would work. She, like, from what I had seen, when she freaked out over her parents, she basically, like, turned into a bomb and I feel like that's the opposite of what you want around somebody who can control thermal energy I may be wrong <laughs> you know maybe there's another aspect to her power because I haven't gotten to know her too well I don't really understand everything that she can do but considering that like shooting at aftermath winds up powering up a weapon that he has made in midair so that it turns into an even deadlier weapon. I just really feel like, I feel like that could be real bad. Oh, okay. Heather says she's immune to heat and fire, which is where he's coming from. That didn't occur to me. I didn't, I thought that she was immune to like her own fire. I didn't realize that she was just immune to fire altogether. Okay. All right. Well, I can see what he means then. But she, yeah, like um, Tristan just is like, dude, she's super duper not ready for this. And uh, I have to trust him on that. She seems very young, you know, she's inevitably going to have to come out here, but I just don't want her to do it yet. Um. So this is when they zero in on this one figure with their heat vision that they're confident is Aftermath. And I like, you know, as a reader, you're aware this can't be all it is, right? 
every the the mention of how sort of slapped together it all was and that they hadn't had much of a chance to really put together a lot of different options and backup plans you know the likelihood of everything going sideways is extremely high aftermath is being set up as a like boogeyman is that's the word that's used earlier he's not going to be killed in this chapter you know however i couldn't figure out how it would be done i was like they could just make a like a hot spot but if they're making just a hot spot i feel like these guys would be able to see the difference between a person and just some machine that's emitting heat or a like open flame or something and it turns out that there are two suits that do different things so one of them is being worn by a decoy who unfortunately winds up dead. I really hope that decoy knew what he was signing up for, but I'm going to go ahead with no. I bet he didn't. And the decoy's suit makes him hotter so that he looks from a distance like he has the same heat signature as Aftermath. And then Aftermath is in a cooling suit that hides his heat signature, which I find really interesting. Even though he can control like thermal energy apparently he doesn't have any control over his own heat signature he can't just turn his temperature down which is interesting to me you know i always find it compelling where the like edges of somebody's power are where's the border where i don't know if we could do that you know um so yeah it is a setup but it's just i couldn't figure out how it was being done it just seemed way too simple that he was lying in wait for them and didn't seem to be moving or making any movements towards escape or like he was literally a sitting duck. And I was just not feeling like that made any sense. And they're all having some misgivings about that. You can tell that everybody's feeling a little bit like this seems too easy, but it's the same situation. They can't imagine how he could fake this. So they have to operate with the information they've got. They got to take the shot, but it's really like, there's a sense to everyone of, Oh God, when's the other shoe going to drop? Because clearly there's another shoe. Um, so at this point he's talking to harm and he tells harm, take this sod out. And harm says, I can't verify that it's him for certain. It's a person, yes, but I haven't got any baseline to compare it with. This could be anyone. And Cronus says, trust me, it's him. And I really wonder if Harm is still alive by the end of this, right? I wonder what he feels after being like assured it was definitely him. And then it's certainly not. Is he going to to care or is it just going to be like, well, that dude was clearly a bad guy. So who cares? You know? Um, so let's see. Overwatch. Which one's Overwatch? Laird. Okay. Thank you. Um, who was near the building's wall was out of sight. She caught glimpses of his black and orange costume from time to time. So she knew he was still there, but Stryker's pace made their skirmish line ragged and uneven. And, this is an, uh, a moment where I was just like, ooh, what the fuck? Because her and Douglas bite each other's heads off a little bit. She tells him to wait up and he tells her keep up and continues on without stopping. And finally, she tells him slow the fuck down. And she feels a little bad about it. But also, he was just completely dismissing her concerns. She's not telling him to slow down because she just can't keep up. She's telling him to slow down because their unit needs to be cohesive and within sight of one another. And he just apparently doesn't give a shit about that, which is another indicator of how rattled he is. You know, he this is not how he normally works. Um Viper had to respect any man that had, had inspired such concern and hate in a team that was filled with so many professional operatives, but it also make, made her dread facing him even more. As soon as Chance and Overwatch were back in formation, Viper moved forward, this time right next to Stryker, instead of keeping their four meter pacing. And she can see that he's like scowling and then just goes, let's go. And is obviously still in a fucking mood about it, even though she was definitely right. 
So, the two teams picked their way forward until they were 20 meters from Aftermath and a small group of his men. Viper checked the location overlay again and saw that Maxim and Augur were still in the first building. And this is when they talk about, like, the fortified position, which we are going to see later. And it is pretty bad. Uh, steel plating with, like, it, it, it sort of reminds me of the... Um, you know, t- towers that have arrow slits in them and they would have downward facing arrow slits so that you could just fire directly on the people who were trying to come through the portcullis. Uh, that sort of situation. It's very bad. Um, and then we get, before anyone could respond, Director McIntyre cut in. Support beta, move to assist Maxim's element, lead, eliminate our target, finish this. Any pretense they were going to bring Aftermath in alive was gone. The director, Cronus, and Maxim meant to kill the man, and that was that. Viper frowned. Pragmatism had always been her leaning, and she couldn't disagree with their logic. Her gut said much the same. They had to be more than uh, they had to be more than that, though, more than simple reaction to emotion. Pragmatic thought was a soldier's way, an operative's way. By donning the costumes, putting on the masks, and standing in full view of the public, they had all accepted that they had to be better. Viper looked down at the pistol in her hand and lowered the power to the highest non-lethal setting. She wasn't an assassin anymore. If her hands were going to be covered in blood, someone else would have to put it there. So, this is a bad time for her to be having this sudden feeling. Like, Viper, you just got through thinking about how rattled everybody is by this man. You just got done wondering what he could have done that would make him into a boogeyman that people don't even like to talk about. And now you're going to suddenly have a moral quandary about taking this dude out? Like, I honestly was so irritated with her right here. You know, I understand the overall the the thesis that she has going on here i get that but you don't know anything about this dude and i really feel if you have got like she has access to a presses that is heavily edited redacted and just generally like she doesn't have all the info and it's already bad if you are going to not trust that your superiors know whether or not this guy really needs taking out, you shouldn't be on this team. You know, I just really hated this. She just doesn't really have a right, if she's going to participate in this stuff, to then flout their instructions. And it winds up that her choice here doesn't end up being like one of the linchpins that turns everything sour. Because I was really worried that her decision to not actually fire for, you know, lethally was going to turn out to ruin everything. And it doesn't seem like it had an effect. I'm curious if anybody's going to notice. That's my main concern. Because I feel like, you know, God forbid, if somebody like Briar were still alive and he saw the fact that she disobeyed orders, I feel like he would use that to his advantage. And if you're, you know, dealing with somebody who isn't just a self-serving opportunist, they're just going to not really trust you. And I just, uh, I was really irritated with her because it's, she says like any uh, pretense that they were going to bring him alive was gone. I don't really know, like, what she's referencing there. And that might be part of the problem. I haven't seen her superiors make any pretense of the fact that they were going to bring the guy in alive. I only ever heard his name at the very end of the last chapter, first time. Other than that, no idea about this guy or who he is or anything. So for me, it feels like you were told that this dude's like the worst. Just do the thing you're told to do. And she's operating from a place of like, evidently they sort of tried to conceal what their actual like MO was going to be. And she feels a little bit betrayed by that, but I can't make a judgment on how like valid her irritation with that is, or if she even has the right 
to feel misled because I didn't see the way that they decided to handle talking about this mission or the language they used. So as far as I know, they could have been kind of like upfront in a way about what they were going to do. And she, because she has her own moral compass that's changing now, decided to take it a certain way until they explicitly said it. I don't know. So in this moment, she's making a call based on info that I don't have. And I just don't really know whether or not it's justified at all. But from where I'm sitting, it just seems like she, all, all the information that she does have that I know of seems to point to the fact that this dude is very, very dangerous. And, you know, try using a stun gun on Tretyak. Like, this dude seems like he was easily more dangerous than Tretyak from the way everybody had been talking about him. And she knows that Tretyak, this would not have worked on him. I'm pretty confident, you know, handle this dude as if that's who he is. Um, he had, he had to get hit by a dump truck going at like 60 miles an hour, you know, <clears throat> and he wasn't even dead. He was just like knocked out. So yeah, this, this choice that she makes here, I was just kind of floored because it's one thing to voice your concerns and not be completely on board before or after, but it's another to mid mission disobey what you've been told. And if she decides to do this again, I don't think she's going to manage to get away with it a second time, you know? And I'm not sure that she would try and do this a second time because when she sees Portsmouth burn to a fucking crisp, I think she's pretty mad about it. I mean, it's not just Portsmouth. Obviously we have Augur dead and who else dies? There was one other person who died. Wasn't there? Um, so I have to assume that the fact that all of these people went down is going to change her mind on this dude a little bit, but, uh, I can't be sure, you know, there might be some other mission where it doesn't involve aftermath at all, where she suddenly decides that she's not going to shoot to kill. I don't love it. I just, if I were on her team, I would feel really insecure about this whole thing. Um, so then we go to Maxim was a man with few regrets in life. He had killed, he had bled, he had done it all for the country he loved. For a world that until rec recently slumbered peacefully, unaware of beings that stalked its shadows. This dude and Cronus, are they both also aliens? The way that they're talked about later, um... It felt like they was, or is it just that metahumans like live a lot longer than I was thinking they live? They may just be really long lived, um, long lived. I'm never actually sure which one is correct. Um, but there's something about this dude that felt as if he were like part of the original like alien race, but. Uh, and not even like here, but when he's being talked about by Cassidy and Ethan later. Um, so to, to, to Portsmouth is a low level regenerator, like low key Wolverine, but not that powerful. Okay. So it's just that he lives longer. Okay. Um, he took a deep breath and prepared to vault over the pile of debris when he heard a cry from behind him. The old soldier spun and brought his Z-sub up to his shoulder just in time to see the Delta team lead fall with a knife protruding from his back. And this is when we see Aftermath in his weird cooling suit. Um, the masked assailant wagged a finger at Maxim. I knew you'd be here, old man, leading the troopies like always. Oof. He swept his hand out in an arc and the uniforms of the remaining Delta members burst into flames. They dropped their weapons and immediately started rolling around on the floor and patting themselves to try to put the fires out. But instead, the flames grew in intensity as the flesh beneath caught fire. Yipes. That's truly awful. And there's a thing that can happen where you're fat becomes like this fuel 
and it can cause this like sort of candle effect and there's just no saving you at that point you know um it's just really <laughs> yeah a horrifying thought and like as somebody who just recently had a fire in her office uh it was a very small fire that like it could have been so much worse and i still feel real shaky around fire lately you know i had this candle lit in the background here and uh it was a minute before I was like able to make myself light it. I wasn't excited about it, but I'm trying to get back to normal. And I, that was only a very little encounter with an out of control fire. And I got shaken up by it. I can imagine that if you're somebody who has had to deal with this dude more than once, just being afraid of fire in a very deep way after this, in a way that I don't know that you could shake, you know, I just think this would really fuck with me like long term watching this happen. Because clearly he has seen this before, you know. Um, so he manages to dodge when Aftermath begins to try and uh, fire at him. He's doing like a sphere. And like I said earlier, he's not shooting fireballs. And like, I guess right here he kind of is. But that's not exactly, that's not all he can do. And it's not exactly his main just choice of weapon either. Um, so here's when Augur comes out. Aftermath threw, hands, uh, threw both hands up in front of him. And a hissing disc of energy absorbed the emerald bolts. Each shot from the Z-sub made the energy shield shimmer a brighter shade of red, its edges wavering as Aftermath willed the construct to strengthen. Every shot added to the ambient temperature in the area and filled it with the stench of ozone. And I'm like, hey, Briar, how about you stop shooting at the guy? <laughs> like, clearly you're helping him. Can you just... Like, I get it. You don't have a lot of options to you at the moment. And choosing to continue shooting this bad guy feels like the right thing to do. But obviously it's not. I don't think that choosing to not shoot at him would have helped at this point. Clearly shit was already too far left. Um, but yeah, so... At this point... Augur deflected the blow and realized too late it was a feint. There was an impact to his ankle and he felt it roll, causing him to fall backwards. He hit the ground, the Z-sub bouncing from his grasp as his head slammed into the pile of metal debris, leaving him, see leaving him seeing stars. Um, so this is when we have the little tete-a-tete -tete between Aftermath and Portsmouth. Uh, I was hoping you'd have Tristan or Laird with you. At least I would have gotten a good fight out of them. And he says, you and I have unfinished business. And Aftermath says, so we do. And then comes the pipe. No school like the old school. I love my powers. Don't get me wrong. I do. But there's something satisfying about caving in a man's head with a pipe. Something visceral. Since when do you limit yourself to men? I've always been a supporter of women's equality, James. Always. Your little girl put up quite a fight. She was such a spitfire. So, he killed Portsmouth's daughter. So, now we're beginning to understand probably more of where his paternal attitude towards Lily is coming from. He probably sees his daughter in her. Maybe she was like around the same age when she died or had a similar power or who knows. But, yeah. He accuses Aftermath of killing her just for the thrill of it. And Aftermath's response is, so my file says, but I didn't write it. Ethan did, which I find very interesting. What is he saying happened then? Uh, and he says, Mary deserved better than either one of you. So... I, you know, not to say that I necessarily believe if I were to get his side of the story that I would think he was like sympathetic, but he's definitely got some different information and I would like to know what it is. Um, so I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to jump ahead a little bit, but basically 
there's a moment here where Portsmouth gets a hold of the pipe and he is bashing the fuck out of Aftermath suit. And there's like coolant going everywhere. Um, there was a loud pop from the joint and he laughed darkly. I'm very glad you're not going to make this easy, James. So this is when we go to Viper's POV. And they're realizing that they got set up and then they hear them calling like, he's here, he's here. And Viper is heading over there and she's running so fast that she doesn't quite have time to register what this little black box that's on the catwalk probably is before she's run right past it. And it explodes. It's a bomb. And she gets like a piece of rebar practically like through her thigh and cannot move. She winds up being okay later. She has her healing, but because it's like through her and it's stuck on the, the, like in the ruin of the catwalk, she can't move off of it herself, you know? So she winds up being sort of stuck in place, forced to watch what happens here without being able to do anything about it. Um, Aftermath sat up with Maxim's pipe in both hands and drove it through the older man's stomach. Jordan could see one of Portsmouth's eyes where his mask had been torn away. His expression was surprised, but overtaken by determination. Aftermath's hands grabbed Maxim's forearms and there was a flash. Fire erupted on the surface of Maxim's costume and quickly spread over his entire torso. Viper watched in horror as Aftermath rose to his feet, still holding Maxim's forearms. He spun Maxim to the side and tossed him onto the ground over the lower side of the fortification. And eventually the fire changes from red to a white and he starts screaming. And, you know, poor Jordan is watching this just like, holy shit. And this dude pulls his mask off. Uh, the man beneath was Caucasian and handsome. His high cheekbones and rugged looks reminded her of her own father. And I'm like, oh, does he? Because, you know, might be related. I'm just saying. Seems like these guys wanted to spread their oats. Um, and he looks at her, but I thought he might try and kill her and finish it off. He doesn't really seem to care. He just looks at her and then he like you know, just looks away and moves on. Um, and he drops his, uh, pulled the belt, uh, he wore off and dropped it on Portsmouth's destroyed body. This is just the beginning. I'll be sending a lot of souls to visit you, James. What is with the belt? Is this something to do with him taking the sample? Cause I was like assuming that the sample that Dr. Spears gets later is from, Portsmouth, but I'm not positive of that. I think it has to be though. Um, and Stryker is like drops in here finally, catches up with them all, sees what's going on, tries to jump after the dude, and then there is she sees like this bomb that's about to go off, and he turns around, wraps himself around her, and basically takes the brunt of the explosion on himself. Um, so the next chapter, we meet a, a new character. She was Anna Hawk, but now she is Calamity. I am not sure if she's a metahuman. I feel like this su suggests that she is the way that she's talking about like back then and now. Um, but we aren't told anything about like what her abilities are. And it's an interesting sort of dynamic between her and Dr. Spears, because Dr. Spears is so charismatic that he tends to sort of steamroll over people, but she is able to sort of see through it to a point that makes him a lot less effective. And at the same time, she can't help but feel a sort of pull towards him. And I wonder if that's not like some sort of pheromone thing that he's got going on. <laughs> you know, he feels like the kind of dude that would be fine with just roofing women left and right. Um, especially considering that it feels so like out of character compared to the rest of her feelings towards him. And when she comes in, his assistant, Karen, uh, 
is obviously not a fan and Calamity just decides to like fuck with her and tell her to get her a coffee to just emphasize that she's in charge and then leaves walking right past her while Karen's standing there handing the coffee she went and got and just leaves. And honestly, that is such a power move. And I really loved it because I don't like Karen. So it's fine. I mean, I totally get how irritating it would be for Karen, but I don't care. Fuck her. Um, so Dr. Spears is weirdly into her and it's unclear to me if it's just because she's beautiful or if it's because he knows that she has an ability. We don't even know if she has an ability yet. So it's unclear, but she is just really uncomfortable around him and she tends to be in control of herself most of the time. So you can tell how much this discomfort is sort of bothering her. She's not used to feeling unsure of herself. And meanwhile, we know how much of a fucking bullshit artist Dr. Spears is. So we're watching him being obviously false as well. And they're each trying to maneuver each other by being charming and like agreeable, but neither of them means anything that they say. And eventually she uh, gives him the sample and we find out that Dr. Spears is behind all of these attacks, that he is encouraging fear of metahumans among human beings. And I don't really understand what his motivation is here. Is he trying to make metahumans feel so unsafe because of like a prejudice that they all f come to him because he's made it clear that he supports them? Like, that's the only thing that I can think of as to why he would have been so effusive in offering help at the start of this whole thing. But he really is not impressed with the whole like abandoned factory fight because everything else is supposed to be like really obvious, really splashy. And this is something that like it was all put down to kind of just a factory fire mishap. You know, it's not high profile. Nobody's really reporting on it. And that's part of why he was sent the sample was to like make up for the fact that this really wasn't part of the deal. He tries to be like, Kate, do you want to go to dinner? And she manages to very smoothly sidestep this. Um, but the, as she's leaving, she says, make sure you watch the news tonight. And later on, we find out that there was an attack that killed like 15,000 people which is just a number that I can't even like wrap my head around. You know, it's just too, that's like my whole town. It's like, if you killed everybody in my town, that's just, it's too many people. I can't figure it out. I can't picture it. Um, so we go to Portsmouth's funeral and Jordan is realizing, and I really liked this, how little she actually knows about the guy. She finds out like what his favorite music was later on. She s finds out what his favorite car was. And she's like, really? Like each time just kind of taken aback. And then it's like, I guess I just didn't know him very well. And that's always a weird thing when you're coworkers with somebody, especially this happens because you can get to know somebody in like personality wise in a way, but then details like that never come up. And you're suddenly standing there going, Wow. Yeah. You know, like this can even happen when you're dating. You've, you've gotten to know what you find important. And then somebody will ask you like, well, what's their favorite color? And you're suddenly like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just part of why we need to ask more questions than we do talk, but I'm not great at that. So and she's also kind of feeling ambivalent about the fact that Briar is dead because she just kind of didn't like him and isn't that sorry, but also he was a member of the team, but also fuck that guy. Like, you know, which I can totally understand. And Douglas is like dancing with this woman. He's made this really high octane booze that actually affects metahumans. So he's drunk. She's like feeling it a little bit. And then she goes out and, uh, she goes to this like huge sort of parking garage and she finds Lily there. Um, oh, I forgot. First, she has a conversation with Laird who tells her that she's a part of the family and not a baby, not the baby anymore. And she really appreciates that. 
um, when she goes out there, she finds Lily crying and she gets very maternal with this girl. And we jump from there to Ethan's office and he's talking to Cassidy and they can see these two women on the cameras and, um, excuse me. And Cassidy is thinking about how he was sort of worried Jordan was going to like get too hardened by her work. And he feels very reassured seeing her comforting this girl thinking, okay, maybe not actually, maybe this is going to help. And I liked that, the fact that that would be something on his mind. Like, I want her to be tough and a badass, but also I want her to, like, stay a person. Um, meanwhile, McIntyre is not really staying a person. Now, granted, they're both aliens, so they're not exactly people, but, like, you know, people in the sense of their sentient beings. And McIntyre is, like, completely blinded by his hatred and rage of this man. And it is so extreme that Cassidy is kind of like, what the fuck is he being influenced by something like what's going on? There is something else happening here. I don't get what is like under the surface, but he has lost it to a point that I'm genuinely like really worried. And every time he tries to suggest that Ethan like handle it differently, Ethan begins to freak out. And it's there's you know i keep remembering this guy who was in the corner who was like made of shadow talking to ethan and i'm wondering what exactly he who he is what kind of influence he's having what his objective is and what's part of aftermath's file that should be there and isn't there um and in the end Cassidy sort of asks Ethan, like, are you willing to do this no matter the cost? And Ethan's like, yeah. And Cassidy says, yeah, I don't think that's like great. You just went in there like a drunk at a bar fight and you cost us a lot of people. And McIntyre is just ranting and raving. I, like, I don't give a shit. And, and there's just a real sense of complete loss of empathy that he used to have um and eventually he kind of composes himself and finally cassidy is like listen combine your efforts with the americans and cut a deal that they track the dude down because they have an, a vested interest in that too but they hand him over to you so that you're not just like using up our team and putting them back in danger and plus we have to like kind of rebuild our team now but also you'll get what you want. And then Cassidy is like, and I will help you kill him if that's what you want. And that seems to go a long way towards making McIntyre feel like Cassidy is on his side after all. He clearly was feeling like, oh, you don't get it and you're not part of this anymore. And that does a little, I don't think it's huge, but I think it's significant. Um and this is when they get interrupted about the attack in Tokyo. Ten minutes ago, the Tokyo Metropolitan Campus was destroyed. Uh, Prisoner 18 was confirmed to be on site by Tokyo's Project 11. I don't think that we've heard of that person, have we? That's not Aftermath. I'm assuming she would just say Aftermath. Or maybe she wouldn't. I don't know. Um, but at this point, Cassidy is like, motherfucker. Because... That's pretty much it. Making like you're, you're, it was an uphill battle anyway to make people feel safe around metahumans. But now it's 15,000 that are dead. Yeah, no, that's not happening. So that is the end of chapter six. So that's where I wrapped up. Um, oh, oh, OK. Thank you. Heather says prisoner 18 is one of the people that was taken from the Dunleavy. I keep forgetting about that. Right, right, right. Um, all right. So I'm going to wrap up this episode Oh, I did. I forgot to mention that. Heather sent me an email with um, a piece of artwork of Jordan in her costume. And it was really cool. Let me open it again because she told me, uh, oh, I forgot that you also sent me the uh, the abbreviations and nicknames and everything. I haven't had much of that yet. But um, she says that it was at, for Emerald City Comic Con and it was by an artist 
called Shimmering Sword, which is pretty dope. And it's a really nicely done poster. Like it looks really clean and just, I really liked it. And it's simultaneously like superhero-y, but also feels like a little like science fiction-y in a way that's interesting instead of just feeling like Marvel, you know? Um, so yeah, I, uh, he got a good artist on that. So, all right, I'm going to wrap. I will see you guys on Friday. Thank you again, Heather, and hope you're enjoying the coverage until next time. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.